Good morning. This is so early, but I've been up since four. For those of you who read Sunburn, uh, thank you. I'm like really comfortable in this chair. I'm like leaning back, like somebody turn on Netflix. Um, I know it's early, and so we're going to jump right into questions. Uh, both of these gentlemen, we're sorry that Will Weatherford are not here, but this is something we've been looking forward to for a while now. Uh, Dean Cannon and I have talked about it a lot, so I'm going to start with, a, I think, a little softball question, and then we'll work up a little bit harder. But we have a room full of leaders here, some of who um, even aspire to maybe one day be Speaker of the House. What is one leadership quality that is necessary to be an effective speaker? Um, that's to me first? Yeah. Uh, I, I would say the number one thing is communication, because... Uh, if you're not telling people where you're going, I, I think all leadership comes down to telling people, here's where we are, here's where we're going to go, and here's how we're going to get there. But uh, I think many leaders fail because they either don't articulate that or they assume that if they're uh, going in a certain direction that people will just recognize what a great direction it is and follow them. And it was great to hear Todd talk about 2009. Boy, nothing was going well uh, in the Florida House uh, as, we, as we moved into the speakership. And so by articulating and communicating consistently, uh, even if the news isn't great, I think people will tend to follow you. So I'd say communication probably tops the list. Speaker Chris Foley. Well, since Dean took uh, that answer, um, and, and that's kind of a low-hanging fruit from the standpoint of any structure that you're in, uh, communication. You just said your answer is low-hanging fruit. Well, by the no, way. I mean, just, you know, I mean, just to let you know, <laughs> just to get it ramped up. It's it's it is the it is the truth whether you're in a structure of government or in, in business. And, and communication is the key to everything because of the fact that, that you're, you're working as a team. And obviously there's multiple levels or different styles of leadership, whether it's democratic, autocratic, you know, coaching styles, whatever it might be. But at the end of the day, the communication factor is key to everything because in this process, it moves quick. And, and letting everybody, as I say, on the team know the play is an important part of being successful in that process. Let's flip it from... What is something that you have seen in other speakers, a leadership quality? I'd like a, I'd like a speaker and a leadership quality that you saw in them that you think is an essential part of being uh, an effective legislative leader. So, for example, the, the good looks of Will Weatherford. <laughs> Give us a, 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 an example of something that you saw, especially because, you know, with Speaker Cannon, you... Um, you came in in a, in a rocky situation, and Speaker Chris Foley, you came in in an interesting situation. So you uh, you guys were part of a very hands-on. It wasn't you were just designated and you got eight years to leave. It was a, it was an interesting transition for both of you all. So what was something that you saw working with another speaker or grooming another speaker that you really uh, I guess emulated or admired? I would say composure. Um, you know, and, and I didn't get to work with Alan Bentz, but Alan Bentz is somebody I've spent a lot of time with and, and somebody who had great composure. Dean had good composure, especially in light of an economy that we had and many of the challenges that we were going through at the time. And to your, you know, to your point, an interesting, you know, time for him as he came in. So I think composure is very important to make sure that, you know, those that are, again, on the team um, are, are seeing a leader that's, that's steady. And, and I think that's an important part, again, of the political process and the leadership and politics. Um, you know, a steady hand uh, will go a long way in, in being successful. And, and I would say I can remember as a young lobbyist in 1998 watching John Thrasher as speaker, and his closely related to composure was um, consistency, you know, commitment to principle. He was only the second Republican speaker in Florida in over 100 years. And he had, they had some unpopular bills and you know the majorities were, were much thinner, but he stuck with, he articulated a, a, a pro-business platform going into it, and I can remember hearing uh, from other members, he said, listen, this bill may not pass the Senate, but we're gonna pass it out of the House. We committed to our, to our voters and you know, to, the, to the chamber and those who supported him. He said, you know, we're, gonna, we're gonna pass this, whether it makes it through the Senate or not. And you know, it was uncomfortable for some of the members, but he stuck with it. Ultimately, I can't remember what the measure was, but I think it ultimately passed. But that keeping your composure and being consistent uh, in your principles, even when it may not be the best political outcome in the long run, I think it paid off for him. I think it paid off for the Florida House. Do we designate speakers too early, or is it an appropriate time? 
I, I could offer an interesting comment on that. I think I was the first person to ever lock up the votes to be speaker in his first term, uh, in my first year, actually. Um, but that was more owing to term limits than, I think, anything prior. I think Speaker Bence's race took four years. I think Marco's took three years. Uh, I think Ray Sansom's took a little over two years, and mine took nine months. And then si Humble brag. Hashtag humble brag for anybody that's not no, 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 no. that. But, but then they bounce back and forth. <laughs> Here's the tricky part. Um, not all speakers you know, make it all the way to the end. I, I think it's better to go ahead and organize, and it's better to go ahead and choose in a term-limited environment. And then there's the testing period, which is between whenever the time you get the votes and the time you get there, you see how you do. Um, and I think in a good way, uh, that allows for either training time or people to say, you know what, we're gonna go a different direction. Um, but I think it's a, it's a natural response to term limits, and it's, it's better to go ahead and let the process play out. It's one of the few freestyle political uh, competitions left where members have to organize themselves, and I think you have to let the chamber do it. But I'd be interested to hear Steve's, Steve's thoughts on that. Well, three days ago, I had a candidate that's currently running for the House <laughs> come and visit with me and tell me that they were running for speaker. So um, to run for speaker prior to getting elected, I think, is a, a little, uh, little much. Um, Are they however, in the audience right now? Just <laughs> I don't know. I can't <laughs> see. <laughs> <laughs> it's like church. Nobody's in the front rows, and that's as far as I can see. Um, but, you know, but no, I, I do think maybe people need to get to know each other. I think my benefit um, is just the opposite of, of Dean's. Uh, you know, uh, we had an unfortunate circumstance with the gentleman that we, we chose and Chris Dorworth to be the speaker of our class, but I had the benefit of being chosen by my class after they got to see the resumes of everybody in our class for a two-year period. So I got that benefit of, you know, working hard along the way and never knowing what's coming your way, but keeping your head down and, and doing what you're supposed to do. And, you know, the, those individuals in my class chose me to be their speaker after my resume was written. So I think, you know, you can have an argument on all sides of it, but as the Dean said, organizing is important because you don't just walk in there and start going to work. It, it's a process. And, and I can argue, though, that I had the benefit of, of, you know, two years leading up to my speakership that allowed me that opportunity to organize and, and things worked out all right. If we think of the uh, political history with both of you all, there were very um, specific moments of crisis around you. Uh, I'm with Speaker Cannon, for those of the folks in the room that are a little young, we, we think about the, the real, one of the last great battles with the Florida Senate, you know, covered nationally, people crying, things like that, where the process basically broke down. And then I think with you, Speaker Chris Afoli, you gaveled out early. It was a dramatic moment. Um, and in some ways, the right deci or decision, I'm sure you believe that as much as anything. But what lessons did you all, leadership lessons, did you take from those moments of crisis? They are so written about, but I'm sure the people in this audience would love to know what was going on behind the scenes and what did you take away from those very specific moments? I, I will say a um, couple things. Number one, even though those all leadership is contextual and the context of my speakership was crisis. We had recession, we'd had difficulty with the party, state party leadership, difficulty within the house. So it was a rough time. Uh, but the, the key thing I took away was something that I got partially from my dad and partially from others, and that is before you undertake a leader position, decide who you are and what's important to you so that when a crisis comes, you're not thinking about it. And we had decided early on we were going to be transformational and stick to our guns on policy even if it meant big messes. And we created a mess. I think historically it really wasn't that big of a skirmish. It just because it was signy die, I think it, it, it added to the element of it. Uh, but decide who you are, decide what's important to you, <coughs> decide how you intend to approach problems before they get there. Because once they get there, the, the amplified pressure of the moment can, can make you either uh, shrink from a commitment or overplay your hand if, you're, if it's, if it's too, too much. And I think by, by deciding how you're going to approach things and what your core values are and talking about it with your team in advance, then you're, then you're better off. Mm -hmm. And mu much the same, I mean, you know, gaveling out early isn't something that you do lightly. Um, in fact, you know, I don't know how often that's been done, but not, not in modern history. And, you know, the reality is it's, it's something that takes a lot of thought, but it, it's, not, it's not the go-to. <laughs> um, it was the absolute uh, 
only way to get the folks on the other side of the chamber to start um, working with us. Uh, you know, it came down to a policy thing that, that we knew we didn't have votes for in the House, and there was basically different levels of, of lines drawn in the sand, and, and, you know, truthfully, that's not my leadership style to play that kind of game. So the best thing to do was to go home and come back and know that we had time to just focus on a budget, which since then I've wondered why we don't have just policy and budget sessions because it made the budget really easy when there was no policy that was being leveraged against the budget. So we came back and did a budget and things went smoothly for the next, uh, you know, 12 months. And I think one of the things that goes kind of understated with that situation and it, it drives me crazy from some of our friends in the media it, they, they blew up that issue and they said it was just terrible. You know, the redistricting process was terrible, the, the lawsuit process that went under your tenure, and then what happened, not one single GOP House incumbent lost. So if there was a referendum on the Chris Foley speakership, you went, you know, scoreboard on that one. Um, speaking of which, how much longer does the Republican majority last? Wow. <laughs> uh, you don't have to go like six months, seven days, three hours. But Listen, I, I believe if the, if the Republicans stay focused on the principles of our party, it lasts indefinitely. We, we have good candidates that go door to door to tell the story of why they need to be elected. Um, you know, we have Republican candidates that win in Democrat seats. We see the electoral, you know, makeup of our state changing to where you're almost, you know, at some point going to be a third, a third, a third with, you know, our party structure. And there's a lot of folks that are tired of the politics. And the fact of the matter is there's a lot of Republicans and beginning to become a lot of Democrats that go out and focus on the issues of the day and not the politics. And I find, and I find, and, you know, people ask me what I miss the most from being speaker. And I say, it's not the politics, but the reality is, the politics is what drives people away from candidates. And I think people that go door to door, tell the story of the why, and stay away from the politics, give them a better opportunity to, to represent a constituency in Tallahassee. Now, when we go to DC and talk about that sort of thing, it's, it's a different conversation. But with regard to your question in Florida, I do believe that, that there are good Republican candidates continuing to go door to door, getting recruited, telling the story of the why, and they can continue to get elected if they're effective in their messaging and actually go to Tallahassee and do what they say they're going to do. Speaker Cannon, do you have anything to add on that? Uh, just only, only that I think what Steve touched on is correct. As long as they correctly articulate the principles that the party stands for and are willing to work hard and do the basics, uh, I think uh, uh, Marco Rubio told me one time early on, politics is not rocket science. It's a willingness to do the basics over and over again relentlessly and then articulate where you're going. I think if, if the Republican Party sticks to that, especially in the House and Senate, uh, the majorities could last a long time. I think if they get distracted, get off their message, get too focused on infighting, I think that's what happened when the Democrats lost the majority in 1994 in the Senate, 1996 in the House. They got so busy arguing over who was gonna drive the car, they drove it right over a cliff. And I, I think if, if the party stays committed to its principle and disciplined in articulating that message, uh, it could go on for years. If the national uh, elections change and or over time uh, population demographic shifts change that could obviously end it but we, we don't know how long that takes uh, I, I recognize that you all have day jobs as as advocates for your clients so I'm not gonna put you in too much of a pickle here but the Corcoran Oliva era is coming to an end uh, it's been a basically a, a four-year run maybe a little, even a little bit longer where Richard Corcoran was influencing that I think we have a definitive break now going to a Chris Sproul's, and then certainly with Paul Renner, and then if uh, the Republicans hold the majority, Danny Perez. I want you guys to give me a leadership word to associate with each of the next three speakers. I know that you probably have talked with them. You've, uh, you've certainly uh, spoken extensively at this point with Chris Sproul's and probably with Paul Renner. Um, so kind of a rapid fire in a way. What sticks out in your mind about Chris Sproul's? Absolutely amazing. The next three speakers are the best three speakers we'll ever see <laughs> in Florida politics. <laughs> no, listen, I, I think um, I think Chris, Paul, 
and to an extent, Danny. I mean, Danny's you know still working his way through. They're they're doing the same thing that Dean and I did. They're watching the folks in front of them and knowing their style. You know, they're they're going to start to develop their style based on what they see in front of them. And and I think they're going to pick up things from Richard. They're going to pick up things from Jose. They're going to pick up things from me and Will and Dean and and bring those into their style. So I think you know to answer that question is is too soon because I think it's more about what they end up developing their style to be versus what they what they want it to be because ultimately I think you can have a mindset of what you think you're going to do when you get there but the reality is we're all dealt a different you know set of cards and we got to play those cards and the decisions that are going to make up their leadership style um, or, or, you know, the issues that are going to make up their leadership style haven't even come to fruition yet. And, and I think that will help them develop their styles over, over their time as speakers. Speaker Cannon, do you agree that they are amazing? They not only are amazing, they will be increasingly amazing the closer they get to the speakership. <laughs> as, uh, as Steve and I can tell you, yeah, their jokes will get funnier. Everything will get better. <laughs> I think I think for Sprouse, I would say uh, dynamic. I thought his his speech at his designation really forecasted a willingness to to uh, play in policy areas uh, from from all over the spectrum, and he articulated a good message. I think dynamic. I think for Renner, I'd probably say thoughtful. You know, he he's a little older than Sprouse, has a a, a, a different perspective. Um, for Danny, I would say probably consensus building. Too too soon to tell. I think for all three of them, right? We don't know how they're actually going to govern. Um, but, but in a nice way, that diversity and difference in how they approach it is good for the house. I think it's good for leadership. I actually, I think an eight-year term limit and the two-year term is a good idea because if you do that job right, it exhausts you in two years. So uh, it'll be it'll be fun to watch. You 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 brought up a point of everybody's jokes. Every speaker's jokes are just so hilarious as they are speaker designate. When do they stop getting funny for you all? So. Uh, um, <laughs> When did you know specifically, Dean Cannon, you were looking around and, and Kirk Pepper wasn't laughing as loud as he was anymore. Is there a specific moment when you noticed, like, you know, the young lions were coming and it was, it was at some point in your speakership, was there a, was there a turning point or a, a pivot point? It, it's funny. Uh, Dan Webster told me early on that the day you get sworn in as speaker, you have sort of a bucket of political capital to spend or dispense. And every time you make a committee of chairman appointment, every time you agenda or don't agenda a bill, you're dipping into that bucket. And the goal is to use it all up right before signing day on session two, but don't be empty before that. Um, we tried to govern that way. I think it's, it was funny. I do remember the last week of session two, it's like you're standing in the dais and it's like, hey, everybody's hanging around Will Weatherford. Like, well, what am I, chop liver? And he says, yes, at that point, you kind of are chop liver because you're on the way out. So I, I think in a nice way, though, the continuity of leadership the House has enjoyed. Um, Will was incredibly helpful to me. He was incredibly helpful to Steve, you know, so on down the line. That's where that organization and advanced planning, I think, in yours to the House's benefit. Um, I think Alan Bentz, Speaker Bentz, used to say, uh, the half-life of a former speaker is about 36 hours. Half your friends will return your calls for the first 18 hours after Sunny die. The other half after that, and after that, it's just you're back to your to your regular friends. What about you, Speaker Christopher? Was there a moment where you saw everybody laughing at somebody else's jokes? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'll be honest, Peter. Um, you know, for me, I, I always felt like it was it was how you treated people along the way. Anyhow, I I didn't listen. There's a reality, and Dean Dean said it. Um, you know, Speaker Benz is the one that told me you know what Speaker Webster told him. You know, and and um, I think you're a fool to believe that those jokes are going to continue to be funny. <laughs> um, but but the reality is, I think if you treat people well along the way, they're always going to return your call and they're always going to laugh at your jokes. Maybe not as loudly, but but the fact of the matter is, um, you know, it's 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 about life, and and this is truly a, a snapshot in time when you're a speaker. And as as Dean said, it's literally it goes fast, especially. When you move sessions up to January in your your second term, you're basically, for all intents and purposes, powerless. Uh, come you know the third week of March, so um, I'm a believer that you, you treat people well along the way, regardless um, of of party or politics. And and at the end of the day, they'll they'll be you know laughing at your jokes and still return your calls. I'm going to uh, make a statement, and you tell me if it how much you agree with it. Um, the Democrats are the opposition, but the Senate is the enemy. 
I disagree with that. You did. You, I did. you of and all even people, of all people, real? I know. I know. I was. I was seeing. I was seeing if that would draw the foul from you. The the Senate um, is your partner in lawmaking. They're your adversary in strategy sometimes. But I always try to tell people never forget. That's our majority down there, right now. As a young legislator, I remember the old adage was, you know, the House proposes and the Senate disposes. You know, they're the upper chamber, and you guys. You know, the, the Senate says jump and the House says how high. I didn't like that. I wanted us to be bicameral and equal peers. My goal was to try and put the House on even footing with the Senate. I think we did that. And in a nice way, Steve carried it forward. I, I feel like it produced a more balanced uh, approach to lawmaking, but they're not your enemy. They're your adversary. It's sort of like a team scrimmage where you're, you know, the orange and blue game if you're a Gator and go Gators. Um, they're, it, it's the team <sighs> scrimmage. Sorry, Steve. Um, <laughs> But, but I don't think they're the enemy. I think they're, they can be your adversary or your friendly competitor, but you, you can't treat them like the enemy. Speaker Christopher, do you agree on that? Completely. All right, so if I told you <laughs> um, two and a half years ago, if I told you that uh, the congressman from the 6th Congressional District and a lobbyist working for herself on marijuana issues would be the governor of Florida and the agriculture commissioner of Florida, and then, by the way, a, a young Hillsborough County circuit judge would be our attorney general. That would certainly be a surprise. You would wonder if I had gone into the medical marijuana business at that point. And yet, as we look around, we have uh, up on the posters outside, Governor DeSantis, uh, Nikki Freed, and uh, uh, Attorney General Moody. What leadership qualities do you see, and you can pick one of the three, what leadership qualities do you see in one of those three executive uh, positions that really stands out to you as somebody that has seen governors, uh, I think both of you served with a couple of go different governors, so what stands out to you about their leadership qualities? Uh, I, I can spe speak to Nikki because I think she's the one, I mean, if you really had to say which one of these maybe yeah. shouldn't be there, you know, Nikki's the one that, that ran from the completely the outside. But she did what I said earlier in my comment. She focused on the message that was important to the people. Um, you know, Matt Caldwell knew water policy. Matt Caldwell knew agriculture issues. Matt Caldwell was, you know, in state affairs. Matt Caldwell did all the things that you would think you would need to do to be able to speak to the folks in ag. And Nikki focused on the message to the people of Florida. And... And she did it in a way that was very, very effective. So I, I think, you know, to answer your question, I mean, her style of speaking to the people, even today, now that she's elected, is going to take her a long way through her political career. I mean, you know, people look at her as obviously the leader of the Democratic Party and the potential next candidate for governor. Well, I can tell you, she continues to speak the message to people. And a farmer doesn't care if you're Republican or Democrat as long as your policies are good to feed the people of the world. And at the end of the day, she's doing what she needs to do in that role. And I, and I think from the standpoint of, of identifying her leadership quality, her leadership quality is to speak the words that people are listening to. And she's doing that. And I think she's doing it in an effective way. You know, the other three cabinet members, they're doing it the way that we have historically seen it done it's working and they'll continue to do it that way. But I think from the standpoint of an outsider kind of looking into the world of an ag commissioner, Nikki ran on, on the opportunity to speak the words that people are listening to. Speaker Gannon. I, I think uh, I'll, I'll speak about uh, Governor DeSantis. I think boldness has characterized both his campaign and his governance. Uh, he took you know solid uh, aggressive positions on everything from the environment to uh, since his election, uh, appointing new Supreme Court justices, he, in his first, you know, several months, challenged the legislature on dealing with smokable medical marijuana. He's just kind of been willing to get in there and say, "Hey, here's where we're going," and um, and to to exercise boldness in choices that I think, in the first term of any governor, were risky, but they were prudent risks and smart risks, and I think that's worked out to uh, to his benefit. I think it also helped him, frankly, having come from a legislative branch in Congress dealing with a strong executive, he both had a good concept of how to be a strong executive, but respect and work well with the legislature, and I think that's benefited both the governor uh, and the legislature. Real quick, we, we're running, we've got about three or four more minutes here. 
what is a what is a sleeper issue for the 2020 session you know forget about schools and and pot we get that those issues will always be talk, talked about what is a sleeper issue or even one of those issues that's going to tie everything up until the last day you know somebody's going to have to make the deal or something like that you both saw those in, under your uh, speakerships what is a sleeper issue out there especially for the the business community not so sleepy that you can't answer yeah, yeah. I, I I actually don't I don't know of any issue. If it were a sleeper issue, I'd probably know of it, and I'd be trying. And you to wouldn't tell us about. Well, it, and right? I try to be get clients <laughs> as, as a good lobbyist. I try and go get clients in that area. You know, it's interesting. If you had told Marco Rubio in 2005 that the top two issues during his speakership would have been property taxes and property insurance, he would have laughed in your face. Hmm. If you had told uh, President Galvano or Speaker uh, Oliva uh, that school safety would have been their number one issue prior to Parkland, they would have said, "Well, but why?" You know. I think the, it's a sleeper issue because we don't know what it is yet, and and that's where that whole concept of being ready and agile is important, because I, I really uh, we don't know, and it, we may not know till we're six weeks into session, like happened a couple years ago. You gonna punt to there? You yeah, I mean it's it's <laughs> it's an election year, you know, so I mean thing things are gonna happen as they are. You're gonna have industry fights, whether it's PIP or you know whatever it might be, but. But to Dean's point, I mean, there's still things developing, and you don't know what the issue of the day is until it hits you. I'm just, I'm so jazzed to be up here. I could ask these guys questions this whole time and just get them in difficult, no-win situation <laughs> answers. Like, um, but real quick, should college athletes be paid? You both are athletic gentlemen. I mean, <laughs> should college athletes be paid? I, I think they should. I kind of think the ability to to gain value for their skill matters I, I think you have to i'd rather it's one of those things that i'd rather allow for it and regulate it than uh, try to constrain it but I, I was not a college athlete and uh I, I don't have a really developed opinion on that but i generally think yes uh no um you know obviously if if you're gonna pay them there's got to be some serious guardrails in place and i just see this thing coming about where now you have college athletes holding out because you know some booster didn't give them what the other guy got you know I just see real potential challenges and the guardrails on this issue are going to be very very important I know it's a slippery slope um, I don't use that term lightly uh, but you don't know where that's going to take you and I just I, I question where it takes you all right last question I told you I was going to throw you a curveball um, when will we see because I keep looking at the, the speakers, and I see Will, and I see Marco, and I see Alan. I see a lot of dudes. When will we see a woman in charge of the Florida House? Great, great question, um, and I think the answer is soon. We don't know when. I think the, uh, the success of Ashley Moody, Nikki Freed, others, I think, I think culturally and societally, Government is not, government, and I always tell people this, government doesn't drive uh, culture and demographics, it's the other way around. And I think as, as women have already become leaders, Tony Jennings was Senate president in like 1994. So we've had uh, great women leaders in legislative branch and executive branch. Um, so I, I don't know, but I hope it's soon, and I think we've got the potential for it. Y yes, I mean, I, I think the future is there uh, for a woman speaker, in fact, um, you know, there's other women leaders around the country. Uh, I'm involved with the Republican State Leadership Committee, which oversees all the other legislative, um, you know, operations around the country from the standpoint of a political perspective. Uh, there are other women leaders, and I've actually asked the question, like, how did they get there? Well, the fact of the matter is there weren't term limits um, in those states, and and that is a big part of, of why. Um, you know, and I think at some point as we continue to recruit individuals to run for these seats as Republicans or, or even Democrats, you know, they're going to find the right women that are, that are ready to go do that. And, and I think that's evolving. Um, I think we've had some, some women talk about it in the, in the past about, about running for speaker. And I think that over time that will come. And, and certainly I don't think that's very far off. All right. Well, I would like to thank you all for sharing your breakfast with Speaker Dean Cannon, Speaker Steve Crisofoli, I'm Peter Schorsch. Thank you very much for your attention this morning.
Well, thank you guys very much. Can you hear me okay? I'm gonna, I'm gonna walk, I got the lavalier. But you know, we uh, talked a little bit this morning about opportunity. And to me, it's, uh, I, I get the visual of a ladder. And there's the first rung on the ladder, which is kind of your first job. And we all find ourselves somewhere on that ladder. It's a, it's a unique ladder, it's your ladder. It's whatever opportunity means to you. Sometimes that's extra income. And as we climb those rungs, those steps on the ladder, as we make more and more money, we have more opportunities around us. There's money for a family vacation. There's money to send our kids maybe to a better school. This is what really America is, I think, at its heart, is a place of opportunity where, uh, as was just mentioned, uh, we're not defined by our zip code. We're not a country where uh, we live in a caste system where you find yourself where you are for the rest of your life before you're ever born based on your last name or what, uh, what area you're born in. This is a country where you can go from the very bottom rung to the very top rung of your opportunity ladder. And we always have to be a place like that. And I think if we do that, uh, as uh, the speakers ahead of me said, we will be able to continue uh, the project that we started here in Florida, which is a really exciting project. You know, uh, uh, Florida is a success story. And you see how we have, uh, compared to the other 50 states, had job growth ahead of the nation since 2012. We have a AAA credit rating among all the uh, credit rating services. We've been ranked number one in fiscal health. Not so in some of the other states. And the great thing about this country is we have 50 states and we can watch what other people do and, and sometimes the mistakes they make. And where there's been a different uh, philosophy where uh, in Florida we have trusted free people and free markets to create prosperity and opportunity. In other states, they've looked to government. They've had a plan for everything. And they think that government is a solution to every problem. But in fact, they've created more problems than solutions. And Florida has been the beneficiary of those jobs where job creators have left those states and come to Florida. So the first answer to the question of how do we go from $9 an hour wages to $50,000 careers is we create an environment in which prosperity and opportunity can thrive. And again, we believe, those of us on the Republican side and in the legislature believe that that is free people and free markets and making sure that the people in this room uh, do what they do best and create those jobs and workers do what they do best as they climb their own economic ladder, their own opportunity ladder in their own lives. But in many cases, and I, what I want to leave you with today, uh, is that government oftentimes has been a barrier to opportunity, a barrier to work, and a barrier to the American dream. That is perhaps most uh, clearly seen, and something I think you'll see in this session, in the area of occupational licensing. And occupational licensing is essentially a permission slip for you to do what you are passionate about, what you've been trained to do, and to provide for your family. Think about that. Government giving you a permission slip to provide for yourself and for your family. What we know, and this has uh, been noted by uh, Democrats and Republicans, the Obama administration did an excellent study on the explosion of occupational licensing. This uh, was created with the idea of preserving health and safety. Think of heart surgeons and bridge builders. We probably want them to check in with us and make sure they've got the training and experience before they perhaps uh, risk someone's life. But occupational licensing has exploded in a way that now everybody wants a professional license. And what it's really become is it's become protectionism. It's become an, an opportunity for those who have already arrived to close the door of opportunity to those who have not. And so it is in, in truth a tax and a barrier to work and opportunity in the American dream. So the first thing we can do is look to deregulate and look honestly at what jobs really do need a government permission slip before you can take them. And I'll give you an example. Say you're a barber and you've, you've struggled, you're on public assistance, you're trying to break out, you're trying to get up that economic ladder, and you have $500 in savings to buy your supplies and get started. You find out that you've got to have an occupational license. And it's a problem in our state when it requires more training to become a barber than a paramedic. And you go in and you realize you owe the state a couple hundred dollars to get a state occupational license. And then they tell you that you have to go to a mandatory school to become a barber, and that's another few hundred dollars. Now your savings is gone. And let's say you're going back to Jacksonville, my hometown, to start your, your business. And you learn that there, there's a $150 local business tax. So your savings are gone, you have no money left, and you haven't even cut a single head of hair. 
This is how government creates barriers to opportunity and barriers to work. So we can do better, and we can, we're going to see a lot of activity, I think, this year on that front. But we also know that we have uh, a very strong economy right now. We have more jobs available than people to fill them. And so this is a unique opportunity for those that find themselves in poverty. If we could reduce just 10% of the poverty rolls, we would see uh, an, a benefit to the state coffers of between $500 million and a $1 billion a year. We have a state of 21 million people, but 3 million of those live in poverty. Of that, 900,000 are children. And it's not just uh, in certain some other neighborhood, it's in your neighborhood and it's in my neighborhood, it's all around us. And with the economy that we have today, we need to look at things like occupational licensing, like what we're doing in the area of education with school choice and making sure children have a customized education to escape poverty. We need to look at the federal level at more flexible, a more flexible way of doing public assistance. You know, we in, in our uh, we know best for everyone mentality, we say you're going to get this much of health care, you're going to get this much of daycare, when people find themselves in different places. And if you're looking for work, then we ought to have a flex fund. We ought to have public assistance that's flexible, that allows for more money for daycare for that single mom that's trying to get a job and provide for her kids. Uh, and, and we're not doing that. And so we find ourselves with fiscal cliffs or poverty cliffs where to make a dollar, you lose more than a dollar when you go to work. And so poor people uh, are rational as well, and they find sometimes that the most rational decision they can make is a life of dependency. Because to, to go out and get a job, they see these fiscal cliffs where they lose all of their daycare benefits, they lose all of their food stamp benefits, this type of things. And, and so we also need to look at how we can better apportion those funds, existing funds. Uh, we've spent trillions in the war on poverty. That's not what we need to do. We don't need to spend trillions more. We need to spend it more appropriately. And the, the good that came out of the war on poverty is to give some benefits for the disabled, for the elderly, for those that can't work. And, and lift them up. But what we did in the process, we took away something even more important from those that are able-bodied. We took away their dignity. And again, if I leave you with nothing, is the, the dignity and the importance of work, the importance that someone gets, we all get, from doing something that somebody else needs, cannot, cannot have a price tag. And so in, in our quest to, to defeat poverty, we have created these fiscal traps. So another area when we talk about daycare is making sure we don't forget about civil society. I think faith, family, and community are really the bedrocks. When I think about where I've come and what helped me become successful, it's those things. It's my parents. It's a strong and loving husband and father, a strong and loving mother. It's I grew up as a preacher's kid. It's a strong faith, and it's strong communities. It's strong fa family and friends around us. These are the things that really build uh, on, on our success. And so if we restructure our daycare, not to say everybody gets free daycare at, the, at the, you know, the stranger's location of your choice, but instead to make sure we're prioritizing that people stay with their extended family, that they stay uh, within their church or synagogue, within their faith groups, uh, so that, that at a lower cost to the taxpayer, we're also getting a better quality uh, upbringing while that single mom is going to work to try to provide for her family. The other area where we need to keep our focus in this strong economy with an abundance of jobs and more jobs and people to fill them is in the area of criminal justice. We know that there's 100,000 people in our prisons roughly today. Most of them are coming back at some point. We do ourselves no favor and certainly them no favor by not providing a job for them when they get out and making sure that they have every opportunity. If someone as a felon does not have legitimate work when they get out of prison, they have no choice but to return to the illegitimate conduct that landed them in prison in the first place. It is in our best interest that we make sure we're providing for those folks. And we did that in this last year. And I'm, I'm about to introduce here shortly my friend uh, Jeff Brandis, who uh, partnered with me on our criminal justice reform bill in this last session. And one of the things about that bill that I was most happy about was that we take extra steps to make sure we're getting people in prison to do the substance abuse counseling, to, do, to provide people with the training and skill set that they need 
to enter the workforce when they get out of prison. One of the interesting uh, uh, places that you would not expect to find uh, a success story is at Angola Prison in Louisiana, where you have people that are under a life sentence, but they're pretty skilled in the construction trades that are saying to the people in the room, Don't do, you didn't do what I do, you have a chance to get out, and I'm going to help you have a better life, second half of your life, and the first half of your life. And, and they are training these guys so that they can get out and get these construction jobs that are good paying jobs that are at that $50,000 level we talked about, in many cases are higher. We need to look at how, how we do more of that and provide for uh, those felons that are returning, that they're not stigmatized for the rest of their lives. And as I see, I've got about a minute and a half left. That's probably a good transition to um, introduce our next speaker. I mentioned Jeff Brandis, and uh, what I, when I think of Jeff, I think of somebody that is, is driven with a passion for criminal justice and how we see in leadership how important leadership is in, in politics in every walk of life. But in politics in particular, some issues never come to the forefront if you don't have somebody that, that drives it. You had William Wilberforce who drove the effort to end slavery in the world. You have people that just continue to, to, to press and press and press how important it is that we tackle an issue that elected officials are not paying attention to. And whether Jeff Brandis and I always agree on issues, sometimes he'll go a little farther and a little faster than maybe I'm comfortable with, but I will tell you this, we would not be talking about criminal justice reform last year or this year were it not for Senator Jeff Brandis. He's been that important on this issue. He's been very passionate and really a leader. And so it is with uh, great privilege that I want to introduce my friend to talk about uh, an area that does relate to opportunity and how we treat our criminal justice reform. Ladies and gentlemen, Senator Jeff Brandis. <laughs> I mean, you're just like William Wilberforce. <laughs> Well, uh, we're going to have a great conversation this morning, and so um, I want to quickly introduce you to Associate Professor of Law at Georgetown University Law Center, uh, Sean Hopwood. And uh, so Sean's got an interesting story, Sean. So you're probably the first person who's ever sat on the stage that has robbed a bank, or, or five. Um, you're probably also one of the few people, or actually, I'm sure you're the first person that has ever um, had a brief argued before the U.S. Supreme Court, risen, written on a prison typewriter. Uh, so talk a little bit about your experience, how you got there, what you were thinking, uh, and, uh, and let's go from there. All right, here we go. So my name's Sean Hopwood, and I'll give you the the intro that I use, no matter if I'm speaking before the President of the United States, to a Chamber of Commerce, or a church, which is, my name's Sean Hopwood, I'm an Associate Professor of Law at Georgetown University Law Center, and I committed a violent crime, but I am not a violent criminal. And the reason I give that introduction is to remind people that, you know, character is not static, people change, and we should recognize that and advocate for second chances, even for people like myself who, you asked me what I was thinking back then in my 20s, and obviously I wasn't. Uh, like a lot of young men, I was pretty reckless and young and immature and you know, just did not think about consequences and did not do a great job of controlling impulses, and that led me to robbing five banks. Um, and fortunately, no one was hurt, but I ended up serving nearly 11 years in federal prison as a result. Uh, and fortunately for me, when I got to prison, I found a passion for the law, started learning the law on my own, and wrote two briefs to the Supreme Court of the United States that were granted, which, to give you an idea of how unlikely that is, a person in pr federal prison filing one of these briefs has about a 1% of 1% chance of getting the Supreme Court to hear one of those cases. 
And so I found a passion for the law and found a passion for helping other people in prison, and it changed my life. So walk us through what led to the bank robberies. How did that start? I think it's important that we kind of build that context of, of uh, kind of what led up to that point. Yeah, well, I think most Americans think when somebody breaks the law, they must be a bad person. Uh, I did bad things, but I wouldn't say that I was necessarily a bad person. I grew up in a household that, um, you know, was not much different from anything else. So in that respect, I didn't really have any excuses for what I had done. I knew right from wrong. Um, but I was running with a group of young men, and none of us had any idea what we wanted to do with our lives. And when you don't really consider the consequences of your actions on yourself, it's pretty easy to forget the consequences of your actions for anyone else. So talk a little bit about your 11 years in federal prison and a little bit about that experience. Yeah, so the first thing I realized about prison was I did not like it. Uh, <laughs> there were not many good things in prison. Uh, the food was not good. Um, I grew up in Nebraska. My dad was managed feed yards most of his life. I like steak a whole lot. They do not have steak in prison. Um, and it's, you know, this environment where you are pulled out of your community and put into isolation, and there's an ever-present threat of violence, and there's just not a lot of hope. Uh, when I was in federal prison, they did not have many programs. Uh, they basically just warehouse people, sometimes for 10 or 20 years, and then they would kick people out to the streets with no job skills, with social skills that well, I always give this example. In prison, when you get into conflict, you know what you do? You never de-escalate. Someone gets up and yells in your face, you get up and yell in their face louder, because if you're viewed as soft, people will rape, rob, and steal from you. So imagine, for the women in the audience, how that plays out when I got out and got married. Not very well. Um, and so, you know, people coming out of prison have a hard time with simple things like social skills and managing a, a checking account and things of that nature. So you get out of prison and you go to a halfway house and you have to get a bank account. Walk us through a little bit of the process of just somebody who has just gotten out after serving 11 years and you know, you're kind of getting your first taste of, of freedom at a halfway house and you're told to go get a job in a bank account. Yeah, you know, most people I served time with, very few people I saw thought or said out loud that I can't wait to get out of prison to go back and doing what I was doing that landed me in prison. Most of the people I served time with, the vast majority, wanted to get out and do the right thing, but it's not always that easy. So I get out to a halfway house and I'm told I can't get a pass to leave the halfway house until I get a job, and I can't get a job until I get a bank account. Well, I go to the bank, and I apply to get an account, and the first thing the person says is, well, the credit agencies have you listed as deceased. And I said, well, I strenuously disagree. <laughs> um, he was like, you haven't banked, it looks like, in 11 years. Why is that? And I said, well, because I've been in federal prison. And he starts typing and starts typing. And I said, you can ask me. And he's like, so what'd you do? And it's at that point I realized I made a horrific mistake. Um, because the last thing a former bank robber wants to say in a bank is the word robbery out loud. Uh, but to my surprise, I said, well, you know, I, I robbed a couple banks. And he said, oh. Cool. And he went back to typing. <laughs> I wasn't able to get a bank account that day. When I went back to the halfway house, they said, you need to hire a lawyer to get this straightened out. And I said, let me get this straight. I've just done nearly 11 years in federal prison. I can't get out of the halfway house until I get a job. I can't get a job till I get a bank account. And now you're telling me I have to pay a bunch of money to a lawyer just so that I can get the bank account. Well, how do you expect me to do that? And ultimately, it was a lawyer who, who fixed this problem for me for free. But if I didn't have that resource, you know, it would have been really hard for me to just get on my feet and get that bank account so that I could get a job and get on with my life. So when did you discover this pension for the law? And I mean, you were working in the law library, and 
Walk us through that. Yeah, well, you know, a lot of people say that my first profession was more honorable than my current profession. Uh, I get that joke a lot at events. Um, but my passion for the law came when I was working in a prison law library and the Supreme Court of the United States handed down a decision that I, along with everyone else in federal prison, thought could apply to us and could lead to a sentence reduction. And let me tell you, there is no bigger motivator for people in prison than the thought of early release. It's one of the reasons why I champion putting in rehabilitation programs into prisons and tying that to the incentive of early release. It's one of the things that we did with the Federal First Step Act that I watched President Trump sign last year. Um, and so, you know, I, I found this passion for working on my own case and found that I kind of enjoyed the law and it was challenging and I started writing briefs for other prisoners. Uh, and now it's kind of strange that I am teaching at one of the world's premier law school right down the corner from. My office is literally a block and a half from the headquarters of the Federal Bureau of Prisons. How's that for irony? So, so you get involved with the Federal First Step Act uh, and with President Trump signed into 2018. Can you tell us a little bit about that experience? Uh, I'm sure it was uniquely personal to you. And what lessons did you learn from that? That I'd like to leave the politics to people like you, Senator Brandis. <laughs> Trying to get a criminal justice bill through the Congress was one of the most challenging things I've ever been a part of. And the coalition that had to be assembled to just get what I say, the first step is two things at once. On the one hand, it's, it's very modest reform and that it will fix some things, but it's not gonna fix the problem we have of too many criminal laws. Anybody in here know how many federal criminal laws there are? Anybody wanna take a guess? No one knows with certainty, but we know it's over 5,000. There are over 5,000 things that the US Congress said is so dangerous that it could warrant putting you in jail or prison. And there are also about 300,000 federal regulations that carry criminal penalties. And so when you go up to the Congress to try and talk them into criminal justice reform, knowing that for the last 30 years, all they have done is pass more criminal laws after more criminal laws after more criminal laws, it's just very difficult. And fortunately, we had great leadership from the president, uh, from Jared Kushner and particularly from Senator Chuck Grassley, uh, the senator from Iowa, who really championed both prison reform and sentencing reform. And ultimately, we got it done. 87 votes in the U.S. Senate for criminal justice reform. To say that out loud is always just brings a smile to my face because criminal justice reform truly is one of the last bipartisan issues in America. And it was great to see the Congress come together to basically make us all safer and reducing recidivism of people that are coming out of prison. We know that 95% of people that are sentenced to prison are one day coming back to the community. 600,000 people are released from prisons in the United States every year. And so knowing that, it seems to me it's incumbent upon us to make sure they come out better off, not worse. So now as a professor, you teach kind of prison law it's, and, you, and you get to go in and, and look at the research and the studies. And so talk a little bit about kind of the, the, some of the myths. For example, do mandatory minimums work? No, um, there is no proof. Not only do mandatory minimums not work, but the more data we have, um, economists, political scientists, and criminologists have all studied this. And what they found is that the link between the number of people we put in prison and the crime rate is not nearly as strong as we thought. And in fact, over 30... You got it? Over 30 states in the last 10 years have reduced the prison population of their state and watched crime still continue to come down. And so there's a belief that, you know, we don't need things like the heavy hand of mandatory minimums and long sentences in order to keep us safe. And in fact, most economists and criminologists would say the number of people we're putting into prison, because prison tends to make people worse, not better, may actually be contributing to crime, not, not decreasing it. So what are some other common myths uh, that are out there as far, I mean, I've heard you say, you know, look, the first five years that you did was, you know, you, you felt like you deserved it. In the last five years, you were just felt like you were warehoused. 
Are we just a system that just warehouses people? Is that what our prison system does today? We, we do a lot of that. Um, and what we do is we warehouse people, and they have no, no, you know, one of the things I had real difficulty with when I got out, I had never been on the internet. Never seen an iPhone, an iPod, an iPad. Um, one of the first things I realized was people don't advertise jobs in the classified ad section of the paper anymore. Uh, that had kind of passed me by. Um, you know, when you're in prison, you're not really looking at the classified sections a whole lot. Uh, and so, you know, we don't do a great job of preparing people for success after release, and it really starts inside prison. And then the other myth is that, you know, we think of when, when someone serves their time, oh, well, they get a second chance. But rarely is that the case. Um, he talk, the speaker before talked about occupational licensing schemes. When people come out of prison, there are several hundred thousand collateral consequences of a felony conviction. It can be legally discriminated against in housing, employment, public benefits, and a whole host of things, including occupational licensing schemes. So when people come out of prison, they don't get a true second chance because that stigma of that conviction follows them the rest of their life, particularly in the Google age. You know, people ask me all the time, why don't you ask the president for a pardon? And I said, well, that's not really gonna help me when some parent of a kid that goes to school with my kids is thinking about sending their kids over for a play date, and they Google my name. I'm not certain that a pardon will make them feel any better when they see I had committed the five armed bank robberies. And so, you know, we, we really have to reevaluate whether these um, collateral consequences are worth it because we want people to be incentivized to get out and do the right things. So sitting in the room today are some of the top business leaders in the state of Florida. How can the business community engage in the re prison reform, criminal justice reform efforts, specifically as it relates to reentry? Yeah, well, I think the business community can play a huge role. We always, with criminal justice reform, tend to look at government and passing more laws or getting rid of some laws. But honestly, without buy-in from the business community, um, I don't think it will be as successful as it could be. And one of the things I would encourage you all to think about is second chance hiring. Uh, we have all of these legislative agendas all over the country to ban the box, the box where you have to check the felony conviction on the application. But if at the end of the day, you find out through the interview that they have a felony and you don't hire them, then ban the box is not gonna work. I would love to see the business community affirmatively come out and say, we're gonna be in the business of second chances. We're gonna hire people coming out of prison. Just last weekend, JP Morgan announced that they're gonna do second chance hiring. Uh, Coke Industries has long been a champion of second chance hiring, and I think if you talk to them, they would say that people coming out of prison have been some of the best employees they've had because they are very grateful for the opportunity and the second chance, and they're very, very diligent. And so to the extent that you can get involved with second chance hiring, please do so. Uh, not only will you help make communities safer, but you're gonna change lives and strengthen families. So during your, thank you. So during your term of incarceration, um, you got to see some of the workforce programs going on inside the prison systems, and I think you had a warden that changed the workforce program. Um, tell us about what we should be thinking as we're putting together and working with the business community to put together programs uh, in the prison system. Yeah, so, you know, not every decision that's made inside prison systems are the right decisions. Um, and I always give the example of, in the prison I was at, we had a welding program. It's quite successful. Uh, this is a, a skill that if you get out, and even with a felony conviction, if you can weld really well, people will hire you. I had friends that got out and were welding for $25 an hour, which honestly, for people coming out of prison, that's the gold standard. Uh, and a new warden came in and found out that the, he could get more money if he changed the programs. And he changed and took out the welding program and replaced it with an associate degree program in business management. Because we all know that people want to hire people coming out of prison to run and manage their businesses every day. It did not seem like the best of moves. And so we really have to get the business community and public and private partnerships to go into the prisons and train people so that when they come out, 
they are ready to go to work. And I have seen that work in places like Texas uh, and California, and I think it could work very well here as well. So obviously we have a, a huge problem nationwide with recidivism, and it's one of the areas I know you focus on and study a lot on. Talk a little bit about what the data and the research shows works to reduce recidivism. Yeah, we know what works. I mean, someone gets out and finds stable employment and stable housing, the recidivism rate plummets. If you then partner that with substance abuse treatment and mental health treatment, so many of the people I was incarcerated with have substance abuse problems that led them to going down a path of crime. And also, over the last 10, 20 years, states have shuttered mental health facilities all over the place and at the same time built prisons. And, and there is certainly some correlation there. Uh, many of the people I served time with had mental health issues. They were not adequately treated in prison. And we need to make sure that they are adequately treated out of prison. Again, because if people are not recidivating, it makes our community safer. And you know, when we spend a little bit of money to ensure that they don't commit a new offense, we save a lot of money on the back end when we don't have to re-prosecute them. We don't have to pay for the prosecutor, the judge, and the public defender. And then we don't have to pay to reincarcerate them. Uh, it's, you know, about f anywhere between thirty to $60,000 a year to house one person in prison for one year. Uh, we could put that money to good use other places and make our community safer at the same time. So how do we get to, to, how do we work with the business community to kind of move away um, from the, the kind of so-called tough on crime policies to more smart on crime? And what does that look like for us? What states are doing it well? And, and who do we kind of lean on as an example? Well, I think Texas and, and Georgia are good examples of states that reevaluated their criminal justice policy, started putting programs into the prisons, started actually closing prisons. Uh, and getting some of the people that were no longer a danger out. I mean, all the social science data tends to tell us that people age out of crime. Um, young men commit bank robberies. 44-year-olds with bellies and wives and kids at home do not go rob banks. Um, and that's true cr across the board. So when we take someone and we incarcerate them past their 20s and 30s and into a place where, you know, they're in their 40s, the data says people just aren't out committing crimes again. And so it takes reform up front of sentencing, not putting people in prison so long, not having as many people in prison. But when we do put people in prison and when we do use it as a last resort, we make sure that there are rehabilitation programs in the prison system so that when people come out, they're coming out ready for success and not coming out trying to find a job and being on that borderline between, you know, homelessness or having to go to crime. Um, most of the people I saw that got out and committed new offenses, uh, it was because they couldn't find work, they couldn't find stable housing, uh, they didn't get treatment for their mental health issues, and they went back to crime not because they wanted to, but almost out of necessity. So in our last few minutes, I always tell people that most of my job is asking people what their vision is for what they want to accomplish and, and who their champion is in the legislative process to work on with. So cast me a vision for what the criminal justice, the prison system should really look like or, or kind of the broader criminal justice system should look like. Yeah, I think more, more focus on rectifying the harms that are caused by the crimes. Uh, one of the things I do a lot is talk to victims of crime and they are not happy about the system of justice we have because what often happens is they, the, the harm that's caused by the defendant is never remedied. And what's astonishing to me is at no point in the criminal justice system does the defendant have to look at the victims and say, you know what, here are the factors that led me to committing this crime. I'm sorry that I committed this crime. How can I fix it? And what can I do today and tomorrow to make sure that this never happens again? I didn't find those questions out until four or five years into my sentence uh, and didn't have a chance to talk to the victims until just a couple of years ago. Uh, I would like to see more of this restorative justice where we fix the harms and then when we do send people to prison, and, and sometimes we have to, to incapacitate people to keep us safe, 
we don't focus so much on punishment. We focus on actually fixing the root causes of the problem so that when that person gets out, they're not committing new offenses. And if we did that, I think you would see um, a system that values individual liberty, values human dignity, and strives to fix problems rather than just taking people out of their community, throwing them into a prison and forgetting about them. Uh, that may work if no one's ever coming home, but again, 600,000 people coming out of American prisons every year. And so we really need to get a handle on how to make them um, come out and have success. So America is the land of liberty. Are we the land of liberty as it relates to the prison system? No, I don't think you can say that. You can't say we are the land of liberty on one hand and know on the other that we incarcerate people in this country at a greater rate than almost any other country on the planet. Uh, we are the world's leader in putting people in prison. Uh, it's, it's, it's shameful. The 113 million Americans, 113 million Americans have had someone in their close and immediate family go to jail or prison within their lifetime. That, that should not happen in a country that prides itself on liberty and has a Bill of Rights that's supposed to make it difficult for government to incarcerate people. And again, if I thought this was actually f tied to the crime rate and helping to reduce crime, I'd still be arguing that it's unjust. But we now know, people that study this on a macro level, know that it's not fixing our crime problem and that we could drastically reduce the number of people in prison and still watch crime go down. And to the extent we should do that, uh, as a country, again, that values individual liberty, we should be doing it. So I've heard you say that, uh, that prison is a horrible place that actually harms people that go there, deeply psychologically harms them and creates trauma in their life that's really hard for them to go come, overcome. Talk a little bit about that and then, and then why it's so important that we create this off-ramp to prison via diversion. Yeah, I, have, I love to cite this statistic when I'm laying in bed with my wife that um, after someone served over seven years of imprisonment, it's permanent psychological damage. And then I tell her that and I say, but I only served 11, so you know we ought to be okay. <laughs> now, almost everyone I talk to that comes out of prison has traumatized by being in prison and being in that environment. I work a lot with veterans um, who have gone to prison themselves in part because they have PTSD from war that's been untreated. And a lot of them tell me that the trauma from being in prison away from your family in this danger zone for years on end was as traumatic as going to war. And so that's not a system that fixes the harms. Uh, it's a Band-Aid on a larger problem. Um, and again, you know, we know what works. We just sometimes have lacked the political will to create a system that actually gets at root problems and root issues and is not just focused on punishment. You know, I'm the least punitive person in the room, but I get it, because you know what? As soon as my kids misbehave, I want to bring down the hammer. But it doesn't fix the problems with my kids misbehaviors it might make me feel good in the moment but it doesn't fix the problems and it's kind of the same way with the criminal justice system and sending people to prison and warehousing them and then expecting a miracle when they come out is not a viable system long term well thanks Sean thanks for your advocacy and uh, thanks for being here today well thank you Senator Brandis